Thank you very much, Sanjay. And at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rajiv Chavla and Dr. Shalini Jaggi for including me in this very prestigious conference. Always glad to be here, dear friends of mine, and uh, thanks for having me here. So as Sanjay very rightly explained, uh, nowadays, uh, pharmacotherapy has changed by leaps and bounds. And we have uh, many uh, agents that actually go beyond glycemic control. So we have three perspectives here. And from the diabetologist perspective, that's what I'm going to speak about. Let me start by sharing my screen. So I hope, uh, as I said, I'll be speaking about diabetes management beyond glycemic control. I do not have any disclosures for this talk. So the question is, does glycemic control alone improve outcomes in type 2 diabetes? So in the series of slides that I'm going to present, uh, you will see very clearly that it is not just blood sugars that uh, matter, but there are several other parameters that we are going to have to look into to have better outcomes for our patients. So just good blood glucose control does not necessarily translate into better outcomes at the end of the day for type 2 diabetes. So we need to have goals beyond glycemic control. So it's not just blood sugars, but there are different goals and I'm going to go through those. Number one is beta cell preservation. So when we are looking at blood glucose control, we should also be looking at beta cell preservation for longer periods of time because this is what is going to give better control in the long run. And that is something I'm going to dwell upon in a little detail. The next thing that comes is reducing morbidity. We all know that the morbidity from type 2 diabetes or any diabetes for that matter comes from its complications. Uh, preventing and treating complications is an extremely important part of that. However, I'm not going to deal with the cardio renal complications and the treatment thereof because the next two topics are going to be about cardiology and the renal part of it. So I'm going to not talk about only that part and talk about the rest of the things. So the second thing that comes is improving quality of life, which is not really talked about much, but I'm going to show you some data and uh, details about quality of life in a chronic disease like diabetes. Then, of course, the most important outcome is mortality. So when it comes to mortality, what are the things that we're looking at is the very important part of it. And then, of course, keeping the costs low because the financial status of the patient is going to be very important because it's a chronic disease uh, over the lifetime of a patient and the costs are going to be quite high. Now, in all of this, when we talk about morbidity and mortality nowadays, there is a new kid on the block which had been known earlier but which is now being, being talked about a lot and that is glycemic variability. So these are some of the aspects that I'm going to talk about when I talk about goals beyond glycemic control from the diabetologist perspective without talking about the cardiorenal aspects of it. So as I said earlier, let me talk about beta cell preservation as one of the goals of treatment beyond just glycemic control. So if you look at this particular slide, you can see that this is just a working hypothesis. There are several drugs that are there on the right side. The beta cell function, as we know, continues to go down over a period of time. So you have time on this axis, your beta cell function, and you know that it is a downward trend. So the onset of diabetes is somewhere here, and then there is a metabolic toxicity that could be rec recovery because of certain drugs that you use. So then this natural history, which is there of beta cell function going down is what we want to interrupt. So if you are able to interrupt this, you could be looking at better outcomes for your patients. And for this, there are several therapies. I'm not going to dwell upon which is better, it could be insulin, it could be incretins, it could be anything. But what you want to do is you want to bring it up to this blue line where you want to reduce the beta cell from uh, apoptosis or the beta cell death and keep that. Uh, you want to change the natural history of that by doing this particular thing. So there are several strategies that have been talked about uh, when, you, when it comes to saving the beta cell. So first of all, you need to see this. 
how do beta cells actually adapt to changing insulin sensitivity? So one thing is that they could change their mass. There could be neogenesis, there could be replication, there could be hypertrophy. And on the other hand, you have apoptosis and necrosis. So this is how they change their mass depending upon changing insulin sensitivity. And on the other hand, you could also have change in function of individual beta cells. What you see here very clearly is that added to all this, there is insulin resistance and a genetic background to all of this. And this is what changes the insulin sensitivity. And all of these factors, such as glucotoxicity, lipotoxicity, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, oxidative stress, inflammation, etc., are all involved in this changing insulin sensitivity. But this also tells us that there are several targets where you could actually intervene, several therapeutic targets where you could intervene to change the natural history of this insulin resistance and the genetic, genetic background. Of course, you can't do much, but the changing insulin sensitivity is something that you can change. And what would be the end result of all this? The end result of all this would be to try and restore the first phase of insulin by giving beta cell rest by taking care of all these factors that I have mentioned over here. We all know about the legacy effect. Glycemic control is one thing. When you initiate that glycemic control and when you achieve the glycemic control, which is earlier rather than later, is what we learned from the UK PDS. So we talk about the legacy effect. We talk about the metabolic memory. So what it basically tells us is that if you initiate good glycemic control early on in the disease, you're going to reap the benefits of it for a long, long time to come. And it is going to affect outcomes in relation to the micro and macrovascular complications. So what this means to us is if you have to go beyond glycemic control, it also matters when you initiate that glycemic control. What is the optimum time that you initiate the glycemic control and achieve it? Of course, glycemic control at any time is desirable. However, if you initiate it really early, this is what you're going to get. The metabolic memory is going to be good. The legacy effect carries on and it translates into better outcomes for your patient. So as you can see here, the difference in A1C may be lost after the first year, but patients in the initial intensive arm still had lower incidence of any complications. And that in effect is the metabolic memory or the good legacy effect. So going beyond just glycemic control at any time is the timing also that matters. The next thing that matters when you go uh, about glycemic control you need to go just beyond reducing the sugars by any means. So there are several ways in which you can reduce the blood sugar. So targeting just the blood sugar does not uh, really, uh, you know, uh, complete the picture. What completes the picture is targeting multiple pathophysiology. So it's not just bringing down the sugar. Insulin can do it. Any number of drugs can do it. But if you have a strategy where you can actually uh, have an effect and influence over the various multiple pathophysiological mechanisms that go to increase the blood sugar, such as insulin resistance, insulin secretion, the glucagon effect, the hepatic glucose overproduction. Added to this, you also look at the renal part of it, then you look at the incretin in part of it. So you look at GLP 1, you look at the various, the ominous octet, and more. So if you look at all these pathophysiological mechanisms while reducing the blood sugar as a diabetologist, then you're really going beyond just glycemic control. You are going more towards correction of pathophysiological defects by attacking uh, in a multifactorial manner. And that is the most important part. And that may go a long way in also preserving the beta cells. Next, as I told you, I'm coming to the new thing that we are getting a lot of data on, and that is glycemic variability. What's the importance of glycemic variability? How do you detect glycemic variability? Because as you all know, you have many faces of the same A1C 
of a 7% A1C. So time in range becomes very important, which means to say glycemic variability kept to a minimum has got huge beneficial effect. So it's not just having good glycemic control. It also means that good glycemic control with least glycemic variability, as you can see here. So this is the time and range predictor of long-term diabetes complications. And you can see this good extrapolation in terms of retinopathy, microalbuminuria. And you can see here that a higher the time and range, lower is the risk of retinopathy and low risk of microalbuminuria, as you can see in this particular slide over such a long period of time. The DCCT study, the Verona diabetes study, the Dove study, all of these tell you that the mean blood glucose or the glycemic variability is very, very important. Here you see a relation to the CVD risk. Here you can see that glucose variability has a greater effect on survival in elderly patients with type 2 diabetes. Then comes the diabetes outcomes in veteran study where the risk of hypoglycemia as much related to glucose variability as to the mean glucose value. So when there is huge glycemic variability, you have huge excursions where you have a lot of hypos and that again is going to affect uh, the outcomes in uh, patients. So this is what it does. And here you can see very clearly, so it's not just the fasting A1C and the PPG, but the glucose fluctuations, which are going to affect oxidative stress, the risk of complications, and ultimately morbidity and mortality. So you are having to, in, in times to come, go beyond just the, an HbA1c, which has been indicative of glycemic control. Our parameters are going to change. They're already changing. And we are looking at time in range, time above range and time below range as markers of good glycemic control. So the original standards of glycemic control are now being revised in the sense they've been supplemented by more information on how that A1C is arrived at. So that is very, very important. You can see here that MAGE is significantly associated with risk of coronary artery disease. You can see very well here that definitely the odds ratio are uh, indicating to you that uh, it is very much dependent on that for risk of coronary artery disease, just like smoking or hypertension or renal insufficiency and so many others. But MAGE is one of the very, very important aspects of this, as you can see. Now comes the next part of my talk, and that is about quality of life. Now, quality of life is extremely important because this is a chronic disease. There is a lot of depression, anxiety, denial, anger. All of these issues are there. Added to that is the stress and strain of financial problems. So the WHO definition of well-being is that there's a multi-dimensional construct incorporating an individual's subjective perception of physical, emotional, and social well-being. And to this, there is a cognitive component and an emotional component. So here we're going really beyond glycemic control because that is just the numbers that you see on a piece of paper or digitally. But what the patient feels in a condition like this, that also is very, very important. And that is ultimately going to affect the glycemic control as well. So when there is poor quality of life, self-care takes a beating. This may worsen glycemic control. That's what I was talking about, the connection between mental well-being and glycemic control. So self-care goes down. And this worsening glycemic control, of course, would lead to more complications. More complications again leads to worsening quality of life. So this is an absolute vicious cycle. And hence, quality of life preservation is very, very important at the time that you're looking at glycemic control. So every little bit matters. So somebody has got too much of hypoglycemia, quality of life goes down. Somebody has got neuropathy, quality of life goes down. So whilst you're looking at the glycemic control, we always have keep another eye on the quality of life and because that is ultimately going to get into this vicious cycle that you see on your screen and that is going to worsen matters and therefore the long-term prediction of outcomes is going to depend heavily on quality of life.
This is something that is not looked at by many practitioners because that is an intangible, not quantifiable entity. And that is why it is not looked at, but it is extremely important. So this is uh, just some data to tell you about quality of life impairment because of bad glycemic control. So there is anxiety, depression, polyneuropathy, sleep disturbances for a variety of reasons, cognitive impairment and dementia, which I just talked to you about. So in this particular study, it's an Indian study which talks about 63% of type 2 diabetes patients having depression. Now, this is rather alarming. And it is not something that we address on a daily basis in our patients. So it is obviously higher with disease duration, with a higher HbA1c, with comorbidities, both microvascular and macrovascular. It's very, very important for us to understand that quality of life, mental health issues must be looked at. Then comes the last part, and that is mortality. So that was all about morbidity in relation to complications, in relation to glycemic control, etc. Now, this comes uh, the last part about mortality in relation to uh, time and range. So the reason I've chosen glycemic variability as one of the parameters when we talk about going beyond glycemic control from a diabetologist perspective is that we need to talk about this because it is affecting. There's a lot of data coming in about this. So time and range in relation to all cause and cardiovascular mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes. This was a prospective cohort study. It was published last year. So TIR was measured with CGM at baseline and the participants were stratified into four groups that are according to the time and range. And what you see here is very, very important. This is the survival. So this is all-cause uh, all mortality, and this is cardiovascular mortality, and this is by different levels of time in range. So you can see here that when the time in range is more than 85%, you have the best chance of survival as far as the cardiovascular system is concerned, as also all-cause mortality. And as your time in range starts to go below 50%, you can see that both all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality uh, start to increase. So the survival starts to go down, and that is very, very important. And hence, glycemic variability, quality of life, mortality, morbidity, they are all very much related. So when we talk about going beyond glycemic control, from the diabetologist's perspective, please remember that two things are important uh, very, very clearly. One is beta cell preservation, and the second is glycemic variability. Glycemic variability, in turn, is going to tell us about morbidity and mortality uh, and quality of life as well. So, in this particular study, a strong and graded inverse relationship between time and range and the risks of all-cause and CVD mortality among patients with type 2 diabetes was seen. And patients with diabetes should be encouraged to aim for an achievable higher time and range to reduce the risk of adverse clinical outcomes. This is the absolute last slide. This is the latest debate. And this was from the end of 2022 uh, debate which again talks about type 2 diabetes, where the weight management is important or glycemic control is important. So if you had to go beyond glycemic control, I would say instead of going beyond glycemic control, before glycemic control comes weight management. It is up to you to decide in the debate which side you're on. At least we can say that it has to be concurrent, uh, if not sequential. So you can see here that uh, they're, they're very related. So it's not like which comes first. They're both extremely related. And you can see here that obesity, you are, you know, there is a physical context to it with respect to food, stress, activity, and safety. In diabetes, again, you have a social context. You have sleep, uh -huh. activity, and social stigma, etc. And hence, you find here that there is a relationship. So is it weight management that should come first or glycemic control that should come first? I would veer towards weight management, but in general, they are concurrent. Both of them have to be looked at. And this is an Indian study which tells you that many Indian physicians find themselves to be lacking 
in time and expertise to prepare an appropriate obesity management plan and patients experience continuous weight gain over time despite being under regular medical supervision. So to conclude, glycemic control is just the tip of the iceberg. Pathophysiology demands that we look way beyond just blood sugar values. Cardiorenal outcomes, glycemic variability, weight management, beta cell preservation, quality of life, and mental health are all important goals in the management of diabetes. So thank you all very much for a patient hearing, and I'll be glad to take questions.